Okay, in this video we're going to look at graphing the space curve generated by this vector valued function. Um, so we're going to try to talk about how to draw that by hand. Uh, and the more of these that you do, the better you'll get at recognizing what shape this is and being able to do a pretty rough sketch without needing to think about it too hard. Um, so we're going to need to set up some coordinate system. So we talked before about when you set that up, it really has to do with where your viewing eye is and that depending on what the curve looks like or whatever your graphing looks like, you might need to change how you have that oriented. Um, so we're going to just kind of start with typically what I start with kind of a standard orientation that looks sort of like this. My Y and Z axes that I have here on my model are parallel to the surface my YZ plane parallel to the surface of my paper, my X axis coming out, and I often tend to start with something that looks roughly like it's about halfway between. We know it's really a 90 degree angle, but the picture, it looks like it's about halfway in between. And then if I need to adjust that X axis, then I can do that if I want a better picture. Okay, so I'm gonna draw some axes here. Uh, and then before, I make a scale on my axes. I might want to think a little bit about this curve and what it's going to look like and uh, think about how far I need to scale off my axes here. So uh, this vector valued function inputs numbers and outputs vectors. So what we're going to draw here on this picture is not really the vectors though. We're going to draw the curve that's formed by the terminal points of those vectors. So we've done this with some other space curves where we pull it out of this vector notation, uh, which really gives vectors, and write it in this kind of notation here, where we input a t value and we get out an x, y, z point. And so that's what we're really going to graph. They're really the terminal points of the vectors. Uh, for this vector valued function here. So the more of these that you do, the quicker you will recognize the shape of this graph. But I'm going to go through this just this time in case you need a little refresher on that. We did do a previous example about this. Um, so I would like to eliminate the parameter and I'm going to focus on these two uh, equations that involve the trig function. So I'm going to solve for the trig function. So I'll have y over 4 equals cosine of t and z over 4 equals uh, negative z over 4 equals sine of t. So I solved for the trig function in both of those. And then I can use an identity that relates cosine and sine to each other to get a relationship between y and z here. So uh, the Pythagorean identity, uh, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So when I use that Pythagorean identity, I'm not going to write that down here, but the cosine squared of t would be y over 4 the quantity squared. And then sine squared of t would be negative z over 4, the quantity squared, equals 1. So that comes from Pythagorean identity, just substituting these in. And then maybe you simplify that and you recognize that it's, you can either think of that as an ellipse or maybe a circle. Uh, so y squared plus z squared equals 16. I did a couple steps of algebra there. I did the squaring and multiplied through by 16. Uh, so that's a circle in the yz plane. If I think about it in three-dimensional space, that's a cylinder that's coming out along the x-axis. Uh, it's got a radius of 4 formed by a circle of radius 4 is the generating curve in the yz plane. And then uh, x is unrestricted by this. So this is a circular cylinder coming out on the x-axis. Remember that what we were really after, though, was the curve, not the cylinder, but the curve is going to lie on this cylinder, and then we'll have to figure out how exactly that curve lies on that cylinder. Um, so y and z will never be bigger than 4 or smaller than negative 4. As t changes, those will go from negative 4 to positive 4, both of those. x will be both positive and negative and 0 and everything in between, depending on what I put in for t. Um, so we'll think about scaling the x-axis in a little bit, but the y and z axes need to be scaled from negative 4 to positive 4. So I'm using a pretty big um, scale here on my axes to get from negative 4 to positive 4, just so we can kind of see 
uh, this whole curve here. So I didn't uh, measure that. You can see I kind of had this one a little bit too close to each other. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're just doing a sketch here, but you want to be clear about that thing going from negative four to positive four. All right, and then I'm going to just do a little dashed uh, picture here of that cylinder. So there's the circle, the generating curve in the YZ plane, and then the cylinder would be coming out along the x-axis. So I'll just draw a couple of extensions there along that x-axis to help us kind of think about that cylinder that's coming out there. And then if I wanted to draw the cylinder, I could draw another copy of that generating curve out here. Remember, the cylinder is not really what we're after, though. We're really after the curve that's uh, generated by this. Um, but that curve has to lie on this cylinder. Um, all right, so at this point, it's helpful to plot a few points, a few key points of T values and X and Y values. And so the better you get at this, the more you just kind of think about it in your head and draw the points there. So since this isn't the first example we've done of one like this, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, when T equals 0, our X and Z coordinates will be 0 and Y will be 4. So at T equals 0, I will have a point over here at 0, 4, 0. And you wouldn't necessarily have to label the coordinates of the point on your picture, but you'd want to plot that in the right place. Um, all right, these trig functions make one cycle through all their trig values in an interval of 2 pi. The period of both of these trig functions is 2 pi. So uh, I would like to plot a point at t equals 2 pi and then at some other places in between. Uh, so the other places in between, I usually just think about when these sine and cosine functions are going to hit their maximum and minimum values. So when we're right here, my y is at its maximum value, which will be 4. Uh, but at the pi over 2 multiples uh, is when the z function here will hit its maximum and minimum value. So I'm just going to increase this t by pi over 2 and uh, plot those points. You can certainly plot more if you want. Um, when t equals pi over 2, I'm going to do the y and z coordinates first and then worry about x. When t equals pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 will be 0, so the y coordinate is 0. Uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so the z will be negative 4. So in the yz plane, the y coordinate will be 0 and the z coordinate will be negative 4, so we'll be down here. And then we'll think about where we're at with x. So when t equals pi over 2, uh, I'll get 1 half times pi over 2 is pi over 4. And so you don't need your calculator to help you with that. Pi over 4, just use 3 as an estimate for pi. So pi over 4 is about 3 fourths ish. All right, so not out too far parallel to that x-axis. So I'm at a point down here. So I'm going to scale this. Uh, so I've got a scale about that far on my y and z axis. So I'm going to call that one unit on my x axis. So 3 fourths would be a little less than that far out. So left or right, 0, down 4, and out, just what would be about 3 fourths of that distance. All right, so at t equals pi over 2, I'm going to label the point here. Uh, but again, you wouldn't have to. So at about pi over, uh, at pi over 4, which is about 3 fourths, and then the y coordinates 0 and the z coordinates negative 4. And so our curve has come around from this point to here uh, as we get to there. And so you can sketch that. I tend to like to sketch these in as I start and then go back and refine if necessary. Um, all right, at t equals pi, so just incrementing by pi over 2 is at t equals pi. We're going to get x equals pi over 2. Again, just using a ballpark estimate, that's around 1.5 using 3-ish as an estimate for pi. Uh, when t equals pi, cosine of pi is negative 1, so our y will be negative 4, and sine of pi is 0, so z will be 0. So we're going to be over here for the y and z coordinates and then out about 1.5. So make my scale there, so out about 1.5. So it's come over to the left side of this cylinder as we come over there. All right, so I can sketch that in here. I should put some orientation arrows on my curve. So remember this curve is lying on this cylinder. It's wrapping around that cylinder and it's coming out at us. All right, I have a little slinky over here as a visual aid. So we're going to look at that a little bit and then plot some other points. Maybe uh, at this point you recognize what this curve is called. Uh, by the time we get to an exam over this material, you should probably recognize that right away from the beginning without having to do too much thought here. Uh, that this is really a circular helix, circular helix 
uh, of radius 4. Uh, these distances are plus and minus 4 on the x and z axis. And it extends along the positive x-axis. It extends forward on the positive x-axis. Right, so you maybe are able to recognize that um, just from looking at these equations and remembering what happens every time you do problems like this. This comes out uh, the same way. Uh, this x is an increasing function of t, so that's how I know it comes forward. Uh, but what I want to talk about right now is sketching that. So when we think about this, I intentionally chose equations that would generate a curve that has the same orientation as my helix here. And this helix is coming out of the paper at us. So here I've got my helix, you're looking kind of straight down on it, but uh, in our picture here we're not looking straight down on it because our viewing eye is not right on the x-axis, right? We have our viewing eye so that it's somewhere else. So when you pull that straight out, I just pulled that straight out, but my viewing eye is away. You can see that you can see those coils. You can see those coils, but it sort of looks like they're almost coiling onto themselves, right? They're not. Those, he, those coils are not intersecting each other, but when you sketch that, because they're in front of each other, it looks sort of like they're intersecting uh, themselves. So this slinky that I have here is kind of nice because it has these different colors, and you can see the different coils uh, coming in front or behind each other, and you can tell what's in front and what's behind. When you draw it on your paper, that's a little harder to do. So sometimes I'll do some parts of the helix dashed, the parts that are behind. Uh, so I mentioned that sometimes I'll sketch this. I, when I'm sketching these, I don't usually sketch them in pen. I'm just doing this for the video so you can see. And I might make some of these parts that are going behind uh, dashed a little bit. All right, and as that helix comes up, and around and makes that coil around there. Uh, we're going to have one coil, but then if you start to draw other coils, remember it'll look like it's intersecting this first coil, but they're not really. They're just in front of or in your same line of sight as those. All right, uh, so we plotted a point here at t equals pi. 3 pi over 2 would be up here at the top. Uh, so you can figure out that the y and z values would put you up here at the top. 3 pi over 2 would be uh, 3 pi over 2 in for t, so you get 3 pi over 4 for your x-coordinate. So again, using 3 as an estimate for that, uh, you get about 9 over 4, 2.25-ish. So just out a little more than 2 as we're up here on the top. So up here at the top of that cylinder, and then about, out, about 2. So again, that's really on the back side, so I did that dashed there. And then as I come back around the front here, I'll maybe make that solid that's coming out of the paper at you and would be in front. All right, so t equals uh, 2 pi will give us that full revolution for our trig functions here. So that will put us back over on the right side of that cylinder. So you can verify that your y and z values when you put in t equals 2 pi will be the same here. But our x value will be bigger. So when I put in t equals 2 pi, I will get x equals pi, so a little more than 3. And so I've come over here to the right side of the cylinder and then out around three units. So that will put me here. All right, so my helix has curved around here. When you, um, if you want a really fancy curve, you could plot a bunch more points at some other pi over four multiples or use a computer to get a lot more points. But really what you want here is just kind of a basic sketch. All right, I'm gonna just sketch one more cycle so we can see those coils overlapping. I'm not gonna do all the points. I'm just going to do a point uh, kind of at each of the left and right sides and then knowing that these guides that I have here for the kind of top and bottom of my cylinder will help me with that. So this was when t equals 0, t equals 2 pi, t equals 3 pi should put me back over here on the left side of the cylinder. Um, so the y and z coordinates will be over here on the left side of the cylinder, uh, the same as they were for when t equals pi, but t uh, equals 3 pi. So I'll get about 9 over 2, so about 4 and a half. So over here for my x on the left side of the cylinder, over here, and then out about 4 and a half will put me right there. All right, so that would have come all the way down along the bottom of the cylinder and then back up over there. And again, I can put as many orientation arrows as I want. We know that this Slinky isn't have sharp corners. Sometimes that might be important when you think about things like derivatives, whether you have sharp corners on the curve or not. Again, remember that your 
picture here does not have to be a work of art, but should be a rough sketch that gives you the rough idea here. All right, so if I sketch one more cycle, it might be coming out. I really just used what I had sketched for that first cycle and then tried to draw kind of a copy of that for my second cycle. If I want to be really perfect, I could plot a few more points. All right, so I used the dash to show the parts that would be behind. Again, this is not a work of art. This is what I would expect you to be able to do. If I were going to do more with this, I might erase some of the guides that I use. Those red dashes that I use for that cylinder are not really part of the curve. So if I'm going to do something else with this, I might eventually erase those parts uh, if I hadn't used a marker to do that. But uh, it can be helpful to kind of look at something like this or get a wire and bend it in the shape of a helix and have an actual model to look at when you're trying to draw some of these things. So a little wire or little crap things that bend uh, are great for looking at something so that you can draw a reasonable picture of it. All right. Thanks.